Um, take your Bible, turn to the book of Acts, if you would. Book of Acts. And uh, while you turn there, I'll tell you why I have that up on the screen. Acts. Uh, let's go to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. Whenever I see somebody wearing a hat like this, or sometimes if I see an old guy with a crew cut, I'll go up to him. And if, if they're not wearing a hat, I'll ask them, did you serve your country? Nine times out of ten, yeah. Well, you look like you served your country. And I always tell them thank you for serving their country. And I mean it. I, and I've had some ask me, you know, back, did, uh, did you serve? And I tell them, no, um, I didn't. I wanted to, but God had different plans for me. Uh, I probably would have joined the Navy because in the Navy, you're guaranteed to always have a dry bed to sleep in. And if the one time you don't have a dry bed to sleep in, sleeping is not your biggest concern at that moment. So that just makes sense to me. Plus, I like ships, and I probably could have done submarine duty and all kinds of stuff, but I did not serve, but I'm glad for the guy. Now, why? let me just ask you a question. Why do these guys wear these hats? Why do they wear them? Huh? They're not ashamed. If sodomites can have a parade where they practically perform acts of sodomy in the street in front of children, men fought and died to give them the right to their perversion. But Darren here is right. By the way, this is Darren. Hi, Darren. Um, they're not ashamed of it. They're not ashamed that they were called upon by their country or... As in the case of some of you here remember Buster Montgomery. The man that went to church here, his wife, him and his wife moved here. They moved to a house just across from the hospital because he had cancer and wanted to be close to the hospital he was going to, the cancer treatment center he was going to. So they moved over here and she visited this church and loved it. And brought him, and before he was ever saved, he just loved this church. And every now and then I'd give time for testimony, and Buster Montgomery would stand up. And he, just, and he was a very emotional man, but he would just tears in his eyes say, I, just, this, I love this church. That's what he'd say. And um, he said that when Pearl Harbor was attacked, it made him mad. And he was 17 years old, and he went to the recruitment center, lied about his age, you could get away with that back then. And I think they probably overlooked it on purpose, because we needed men. Um, it was uh, President Eisenhower, his last speech that he made before he left office, which was the... He made the speech, the military-industrial complex speech. But he said our nation at, was forced into a situation where we had to learn to beat our plowshares into swords. Meaning that at the outset of World War II, we didn't have a very big, effective military. But we sure invented one. Had it not been for America, 
Japan and Adolf Hitler would have ruled the world. So Bud Buster was, it made him mad. He went to the recruitment center, asked him, how old are you, son? He said, I'm 18 years old. He was 17 years old. He lied about it. But they signed him up in the Navy, trained him, sent him over his first day. Getting off that plane at Pearl Harbor, they put a suit on him and had him go and dragging bodies out of those ships. Then they put him on a submarine. And he didn't have it too bad on that submarine because the captain of the sub, the skipper, loved home-baked bread. And nobody, not even the cooks, knew how to bake bread. Buster, for some reason, learned how to bake bread. He said, I know how to bake bread. They said, you're baking bread for the captain every day. So he baked bread. But he said he sat, he told me this when I went over to his house one day. He told me this, he said... I would lay in my bunk and those Japanese mines were going off. It just sounded like they were within inches of our ship. And he said, I just knew at any minute I'd be blown to bits. Well, he made it off. And he said, the, he said our crew came off, another crew went on that ship, and that ship never came back. And God spared him all his life until the day he asked me on the way out of church. He said, can you come by? He knew I liked sweet tea and he liked sweet tea. And he said, can you come by my house this week? I'm going to fix you up some sweet tea. I'm going to talk to you. And I said, okay, Buster, I'll be over there. So I went over there that Saturday and we talked about submarines and we talked about the war. We talked about this. And he finally stopped and he said, let me tell you what I'm really asking you. He said, how can I know for sure that I'm going to heaven? And he's a good man. But he wasn't saved. So he asked Jesus into his heart right there in his living room. Tears in his eyes. And then he said this. He said, okay, now if I get this right, now i got to be baptized, right? I've never had anybody ask me that. Yeah, you got that right. We'll baptize you. We baptized him. And then, and, and at the time, he was perfectly healthy. He thought he had beat the cancer. A year later, the cancer came back and killed him. But he was not ashamed, number one, he was not ashamed of serving his country. And he had to kill people. But he wasn't ashamed. Because those people that he killed were evil. He was not ashamed of who he was, what he had done. He was not ashamed because he served his country. And here's, here's my point in all this. And he was willing to die for it. He was willing to die for his country. The question I want to ask you this morning is, is our country still worth dying for? Absolutely it is. Absolutely it is. You can't go to church in Great Britain carrying a pistol like some of y'all are carrying right now. You can't do that. You can't go to church in Australia, Canada, Russia, China, Iran, Netherlands. You cannot go to church anywhere in any other country carrying a sidearm, either concealed or wide open. You cannot do that. But you can do that here. So this country, as far as I'm concerned, is still worth living in, being proud of, and worth dying for. Amen? Amen. Now, so these guys, they wear their hats. 
and I love to see them, and if I see them, I'm going to go to them, I'm going to shake their hand, and I've never had any of them say, get away from me. I don't want your thanks. I've never had any of them do that. And most of the time when I ask them, where did you serve? Man, I get into a conversation. And I love to hear their stories. One guy told me uh, Friday, he said, I, had, he said I, was, I, I served during Vietnam, but I had it easy. He said, I was a top secret courier here in the States. I said, oh, you were the one transporting aliens to Area 51. He laughed. I've had guys tell me, we worked, uh, I, he said, I worked as a guard at a, at a nuclear missile base in Germany. I said, yeah, keeping the Russians in their, own, in their own yard. He said, that's exactly right. Somebody had to. If it wasn't for them and us putting missiles in Germany with our guys guarding them, if Russia's the only country in the world that's got nuclear weapons, nobody else stands a chance. But because we built them up and built them up and built them up and built them up, we developed what was called the, the Mutually Assured Destruction Doctrine, which meant to both sides, as soon as you send yours, we're sending every one of ours. So what's, and it finally, finally both sides said, what's the point? We're going to kill the whole world. So let's just don't push the button. Reagan was right. It worked. But none of these guys were ashamed of what they did. And that's what I'm going to get to this morning. Take your Bible and turn to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, the Holy Ghost has fallen upon the disciples. They're preaching in languages. And in verse 37... This is, now, watch this now. This is not in a church meeting because there are no church buildings at this time. There are no church buildings at this time. This is outside. And they said, verse 37, now when they heard this, Peter's, Peter's preaching the gospel. Verse 37, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as, are, as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Verse 41. Then they that gladly received his words were baptized. Where were they baptized? In a, little, in a secret place? No. In public. They were baptized. They that gladly received his words were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers and fear. Look at this, verse 43. Fear came upon every soul and many signs and wonders were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things common and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need and they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and uh, breaking bread from house to house and did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord added to the church such da daily such as should be saved father asked for your help to preach the message I don't think I was prepared well enough I don't think I can preach it well enough. I don't think I know what to say. But I know what's in my heart. And I pray, dear God, that you would speak uh, words to these people far better than I could. Father, we thank you, Lord, for... 
people, people that I've met, that as I watched their lives, God, they were never ashamed of who they were. They were never ashamed that they were a born-again Christian. They didn't try to hide it. They didn't try to do it secretly. They let everybody know, and they did it in love, but they let everybody know that they were a Christian. And God, you gave me some good men in my life as a young man who I saw and watched their life. They were never, they were never ashamed. Never afraid. Father, that's how I want to be. That's how I want our church to be. Never afraid. Never ashamed. Never back down. Never compromise. Do everything that we do with love for lost people because we used to be lost people. But help us, dear Father, to be faithful to you, even the cost of our own life. Bless your word today. Help me preach it today in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. Uh, let me ask you a question this morning. Who does not want to die? Raise your hand. I don't want to die. That's the normal state of, of mind that we have. We have in our nature, it is in our nature to protect our own life. If somebody comes at us, it is in our nature to try to protect ourselves somehow, some way from harm. It is in our, it's in our will to want to live. However, Everybody that you know either has died or is going to die. Everybody. You yourself are going to die. You're going to die. You're going to leave this world. Your life is going to end. Everything that you've got, everything that you will have is gone. And you're going to die. So, my question is, why not be willing to die for who you are and what you believe? Amen? I mean, everybody's going to die. And, I, you know, what, you, what gets me is... These people that sign up for the military who all of a sudden say, well, I don't want to die. Excuse me. If you put on a uniform, you're supposed to go and get shot or blown up. If the cause is right, and if you're to protect something that's worth protecting, like maybe a hill or, or an ammunition place or your fellow soldiers or whatever, if you wear the uniform, you've already said, I am prepared to die. I mean, what is this? Protect and defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Well, what if protecting and defending the Constitution means that you have to defend it with your life. Are you willing to do it? You should be. You put on a uniform. My thing is, if you go join the military, you signed your name and said, I'm willing to die for country. And let me tell you something. You are an ambassador if you are saved. You are an ambassador of Jesus Christ. You put on a uniform. You put on Christ. As Christ was willing to die 
for you, you likewise, and me likewise, should be willing to die for our faith, our Bible, our beliefs, and never back down. Never back down. I don't like liberals. Liberals never pick up a weapon. Weapons are bad. Armies are evil. Defense of our nation is, that's murder. And yet they kill unborn babies. That's the stupidity of liberalism. Turn to Acts chapter 4. Now, here's what I'm, here's what I'm getting at. I preached this message a long time ago, and I'm going to preach it again. I call it Christianity coming out of the closet. If the sodomites can come out, if the perverts can come out, If a man puts on a dress and demands that you call him madam and he ain't ashamed of that, then you ought not be ashamed to say, I believe in God and his son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Acts chapter 4, verse 1. And as they spake unto the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the, the resurrection from the dead. See, the Sadducees were, were a, a, a sort of a denomination of the Jews that for some strange reason did not believe in the resurrection. So here come Peter, James, and John and all those other guys they come preaching the resurrection of the dead through Jesus Christ. You know what that is to us? We call it the rapture. I'm going to, I'm going to go to uh, I'm going to go up to Fargo. They've given me permission. I'm going to go up there and preach about the rapture. Now it's probably going to make some people mad about what I believe about it. I don't care. But I'm going to preach it because it's going to happen. One of these days, Christ is going to appear in the air. He's going to sound a trumpet. We're, the dead of Christ, they get to go first. They died first. They get to go first. Then we which are alive remain shall be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. That is going to happen. I believe that God created the universe 6,000 years ago, did it in six days. I believe that, and I'm not ashamed of it. And they want to call us idiots. They want to call us un ignorant. They want to call us unlearned. They want to make fun of us. They said that, that, that's not possible. There's no way. You, you religious fanatic, what are you, flat earth or two? No, that's stupid. But I believe God created everything that is, and he did it in a short, he could have done it shorter than what he did, but he did it in six days. I believe that, and I'm not ashamed to admit it. I'm not ashamed to say it, and I'm not ashamed to tell my children don't believe. We've got, we've got families that are watching us that com are compelled in the nation where they live to send their children to public school. Compelled to do it. They do not get to homeschool. At least here, we can still teach our children how we believe. That's a gift. But those parents then take those children home and they are in danger because if the government ever finds out about it, those people could have their children taken away from them. How would you like that? Just for teaching your children, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth and the earth was without form and void and darkness was just upon the face of the deep and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters and God said, let there be light and there was light. Just for teaching your children, Genesis 1, they could lose their children and go to jail for that. And that's what liberals want to do in this country as well. 
take away your rights to educate your children the way you believe. But it's been proven over and over and over again at the National Spelling Bee that it's the homeschool kids that are smarter than the other kids. They can spell better. So the Sadducees, they were grieved, verse 2, being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in hold until the next day, for it is now at eventide. Howbeit many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of them of men was about 5,000. Hey, they preached the resurrection. 5,000 people got saved, and the Sadducees arrested the people that were preaching it. They said, we can't have that. You know what the people did that were arrested? They kept preaching it. You don't have anything to be ashamed of. You used to. You used to have something to be ashamed of, didn't you? Back when you were living in sin. Back when you were a servant of sin. Should we all stand up, starting with our new friend Darren here? Should he stand up and start telling everybody everything he did when he's lost? He's, he's going, no, no, we're not going to do that. You used to be ashamed, but now you have nothing to be ashamed of. Don't be ashamed when you go to the restaurant after church and the waitress has to stand there and hold the food while you bow your head and you say a prayer of thanksgiving over your meal. And if she don't interrupt you, tip her more. Amen? Now if she interrupts you, tip her, just don't tip her much. Okay? But they were not ashamed of who they believed in. And they were not ashamed of the resurrection. And we, we are not ashamed that we believe one Bible. One Bible. I'm not ashamed of that. When I sort of came back to my senses years ago. I thought that the denomination that I was a part of would be proud of me and my stand for the Word of God. And you know what I got out of the leader of the state of the, the state of Missouri Free Will Baptist leader, you know what he did? He mocked me. He laughed at me. I asked him if I could put a, a table up, a display at the state Free Will Baptist meeting so I could give away my, back then it was videotapes. And you know what he said? We don't have any room for you. You can go outside if you want and hand them out, but we don't have any room inside for you. He didn't want me there. And I almost went. But then I was, I thought, man, that'd be in the flesh. I'm not ashamed of what I believe in. I'm coming out of the closet. I'm a Christian. I believe Jesus Christ died for sinners of whom I am chief. Amen. Amen. Rest us, imprison us, take away all our stuff. You're not going to take away our belief. Turn to Acts, you're in Acts chapter 4, look at verse 13. Look at verse, look at verse 13, look at verse 13. Now when they saw the what? Boldness. When they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men. Look at that. Unlearned. And ignorant. That means that we don't say, 
Subtle, we say subtle. We don't say wash, we say wash. Amen? Are you washed in the blood? We, don't, we didn't go to get a PhD in how the universe is 13 billion years old. We don't believe that. So that makes us unlearned and ignorant people. But, they, when they learned, they were unlearned and ignorant men. They marveled. They took knowledge of them that they had been with who? I want to ask you a question. Have you been with Jesus this week? Amen. You may be unlearned and ignorant, but you've been with Jesus. Amen. He's smarter than the smart. Amen. He's wiser than the wise. He is more intelligent than the Einsteins of this world. He not only knows the world, he created the world. Don't ask him to believe the earth is 13 billion years old. He knows he created it 6,000 years ago. Amen. You know, they, you know what they've made a meme of? They put this on the internet of Jesus riding a dinosaur. And you know what? That's intended to mock creationists. Oh, you believe Jesus rode a dinosaur. I may be unlearned and ignorant when it comes to what this world thinks. But I've been with Jesus. And if you've been with Jesus, everybody's going to know it. Amen? You know, I don't have this in my notes. Somebody help me out here. Where is it? There's a place where Paul wrote, Ye are our epistle. No, written and known of men. Who can find that for me? First person finds that gets a gets one of Jennifer's packages on that table back there. <laughs> ye are ye are the epistle. Where is it? Look, get your phone out. Come on, it's, this is the twenty first century. Where, where is it, Jennifer? 2 Corinthians, she's protecting her presence. Look at her. <laughs> you ain't getting mine. Yeah, here it is. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. <laughs> Verse 1. Do we, begin it, do we begin again to commend ourselves, or need we as some others epistles of condemnation or commendation to you, or letters of commendation from you? Ye are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read of all men. For as much as you are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshy tables of the heart. When people see you and get to know you, they know that you believe in Jesus and you are the Word of God to them. If, you read the Word of God. Now, if you spend all week reading comic books, love stories, mystery stories, or watching TV, then people th think that you watch TV or too much TV. But if you'll read this book, It'll come out of you. And people will know that you're a person who believes the Bible. Because it's written in you. Amen? Back at Acts chapter 4, verse 13. Jennifer, you just saved all those presents on the table. Congratulations. Look at verse, uh, Acts chapter 4, verse 13 and 14. They, they perceived they were unlearned and ignorant men, but they had been with Jesus. Verse 14, beholding the man which was healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do to these men? For that indeed a notable miracle hath been done by them is manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But that it spread no further among the people, let us straightly threaten them, that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. Do you know why they hate Trump so much? Trump 
couple weeks ago, issued forth guidelines to allow public school children to pray if they want to. Why does it take a lost man to stand up for Christians' rights when Christians should stand up for Christians' rights? You know why I believe that man's in office and doing what he's doing? God is using him to embarrass us because he's doing what we should have done ourselves. Amen. Um, verse 17. But that it spread no further among the people, let us straightly threaten them that they speak henceforth to no man in, his, in this name. Verse 18. And they called them and commanded them to, not to speak at all or teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. For we cannot, listen to how, what they're saying, we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them because of the people. For all men glorified God for that which was done. For the man was above 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing was showed. They will threaten you. Don't back down. You're, and I'm talking about your family members. Your own family members. They will threaten you. Well, we won't come around. You won't be allowed in our house. We won't let you see our children. We won't let you do this. We won't let you do that. Because you believe in this. Because you're pro-Second Amendment. Because you're pro uh, you're pro Bible. You're pro this. We don't want you around. Don't let those people scare you. Turn to Acts chapter 5. Or you could just read what I have up on the screen there. If you're the bionic man. I was in Corinthians. Hang on a second. Acts chapter 5. Verse 17. Then the high priest rose up, and all they that were with him, which is of this, uh, the sect of the Sadducees, remember, they don't believe in the resurrection, and were filled with indignation. That sounds like Nancy Pelosi. That woman is never going to be happy the rest of her life. You know that? She's going to be a miserable human being. And they laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. Are you afraid? Are you afraid to be caught praying? Are you afraid to be caught speaking about Jesus? Are you afraid to be caught reading your Bible? Are you ashamed? Or are you like those guys who went and served in Korea, Vietnam, Iraq? Are you proud like those men who wear their hats because they're proud that they went and served their country? Vietnam was not a popular war. It was not a popular war. Iraq was not a popular war. But the men that served were not ashamed that they served. Um, trying to think of his name, Kyle. Chris Kyle. Clint Eastwood made a movie about that man. It's pretty accurate from what I hear. And when he came back from his last tour, they sent him to a psychologist because they were afraid that you know, he might be losing it for what he did, might have post-traumatic stress syndrome. You know what he said? 
He said, I'm willing to stand before God and give an account for every shot I made. Because he did so protecting his fellow soldier. And he was not ashamed of what he did. Now, Christianity is not popular anymore. Reading and believing a Bible is not fashionable. It's not politically correct. But it's right. And there's nothing, nothing for you to be ashamed of. Nothing. Where was I? Verse um, 17 again, The high priest rose up, and all they that were with him, which is of the sect of the Sadducees, and were filled with indignation, laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. But the angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors and brought them forth and said, Go stand and speak in the temple to, to, to the people all the words of this life. And when they heard that, they entered into the temple early in the morning and taught. But the high priest came and they that were with him and called the council together and all the senate of the children of Israel and sent to the prison to have them brought. But when the officers came and found them not in the prison, they returned and told, saying, The prison truly we found shut with all safety and the keepers standing without before the doors. But when we had opened, we found no man within. Now when the high priest and the captain of the temple and the chief priest heard these things, they doubted of them whereunto this would grow. They, you know what they were saying? We got to cover this up. So verse um, 25, Then came one and told them, saying, Behold, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple, teaching the people. Then went the captain with the officers and brought them without violence, for they feared the people, lest they should have been stoned. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest asked them, saying, Did not we straightly command you that you should not teach in this name? And behold, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, underline this in your Bible, we ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior, for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are as witnesses of these things, and so also is the Holy Ghost, whom God has given to them that obey them. They were not afraid. They were not ashamed. And God opened the prison doors, let them out. And you know what they did? Instead of running and hiding, they went back to the temple, right back at it. And they said, I dare you to arrest me again. People ask me all the time, Pastor, you think the church is about ready to go underground? I said, no. No, no underground church. If it gets so bad, that they have to start arresting people and putting us out of our homes, then let them do it. But I will not turn my back on my Savior. <laughs> Verse 33, same chapter. When they heard that, they were cut to the heart and took counsel to slay them. Then stood there up one in the council, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, doctor of the law, had in reputation among all the people, commanded to put the apostles forth a little space, and said unto them, Ye men of Israel, take heed to yourselves. What in ye intend to do is touching these men. For before these days rose up uh, Theod Theodos, boasting himself to be somebody, to whom a number of men, about 400, joined themselves, who was slain, and all as many as obeyed him were scattered and brought to naught. In other words, they said, We've had this happen before. You remember that guy Theodos? He had about 400 people following him, and, uh, he had, and all of a sudden he was slain. And what happened to his people? They all scattered and ran. And he said, uh, verse 38, And now I say unto you, refrain from these men, even, as, even let them alone, for if this counsel or this work be of men, it will come to naught. But if it be of God, you cannot overthrow it, lest happily you be found even to fight against God. And to him they agreed, and when they called the apostles and beaten them, they got a beating. They commanded they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple and in every house they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. 
I got, a, I got a lot more to go, but I'm going to move on. I'm going to end this with this. Turn to, turn to Romans chapter 8. Lots of examples in the book of Acts. Lots of examples in the book of Acts. Of people. And all they did was believe in Jesus. All they did was believe in Jesus. And then tell somebody about it. And they were never ashamed. Some of them lived. Most of them died. John. John, the, the Apostle John is the only one that we know of that died of old age. The only one. Tradition tells us that at one time they tried to kill John by throwing him in a vat of boiling oil. He lived through it. And since they decided they couldn't kill him, they exiled him on the Isle of Patmos. And it was while he was on the Isle of Patmos that he saw the whole book of Revelation and wrote it down. Now, I don't know what's worse, being killed in a vat of boiling oil or living through being killed in a vat of boiling oil. But let me leave you with this, Romans 8, 35. Do you believe your Bible? Say amen. amen. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation? The answer is no. Distress? No. Persecution? No. Famine? No. Nakedness? No. Peril? No. The sword? No. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long, we are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Listen to me, people. You're going to die, right? You're going to die. It ain't like they're going to do something to you that doesn't happen to everybody else in the world. Everybody's going to die. You might as well die for the right reason. You might as well die for the Lord Jesus Christ. If you live for Him, die for him verse 37 nay in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us for I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord you are going to die of something. My prayer, and I actually prayed this, God, if I'm to die, I want to die serving you. That's not just braggadocio, but that's not me just boasting trying to act spiritual. What's been done for me, I can never pay back. What's been done for my wife, I can't pay that back. What's been done for my family, I can never pay that back. but I can live for Jesus and I can die for Jesus. And we're getting to a time, people, where we're about to become, Hillary was right, we are the deplorables. That's how, she wasn't kidding, that's how they see us. And they're on the rise and they're on the march. Are you willing come out of the closet and say I'm a Christian no I won't drink that I'm a Christian 
No, I won't smoke that. I'm a Christian. You know, that joke is funny, but I won't laugh at that. I'm a Christian. I'm angry. I want to curse. But I'm a Christian. Y'all want to steal time from the boss? Steal time from the boss. I won't. I'm a Christian. And if it comes to them asking me that I did something wrong or you did something wrong, I'm going to stand up for what's right. Amen. Come out of the closet, people. Come out of the closet. I want you to bow your heads. I'm not, I'm not going to ask you to come down unless you want to. But I want you to ask the question, do people read me? Do people read the Word of God when they see me? Do people know that I'm a Christian? Am I ashamed of Jesus? Am I ashamed to let people know it? Do I back down to my friends, my family members, my co-workers? Every man I met that wore his military cap, he was not ashamed, not ashamed that he put on a uniform. He was not ashamed. And he served with honor. He saw his friends killed. My uncle, out in one of those Pacific islands, a bomb went off and he heard his best friend say to him, Harry, can you help me? And he looked and the man was trying to put his guts back in and he died. But he was not ashamed of serving his country. And I don't want you to be ashamed to serve Jesus. So this morning, with your head bowed, I just want you to talk to God for a minute and ask Him, God, am I bold enough? I'm not telling you to go out and be a jerk everywhere. There's enough of that. But if you're afraid of losing friends, remember something. You have a friend that sticketh closer than a brother that would never leave you, no matter what you did or said. And a friend you have in this world that would despise you because of what you believe, they're not really your friend. So this morning, I'm just going to ask you to spend some time with God and say, God, do people really know who I am? Am I hiding it? Do I compromise? If I do, I'm sorry. I want to be the epistle of God, known of men. Father, come before you today. I struggle with this message. Struggle writing it, struggle preaching it. But I love you, and I am going to die of something. And God, I'd rather just die 
doing something for you. And I mean that. I thank you, God, I live in a country that I don't have to be, I don't have to hide who I am. I don't have to cover up being a Christian. But those things are fleeting. And our enemies are gaining ground. And there may very well come a time when just believing in Jesus could cost us everything. Lord, help us to be willing to pay the price because the reward that we have in heaven is far greater than anything we'll lose down here. Help us to see it that way. Help us to not be ashamed of who we are and what you've made us. Help your people, dear God, to be who we are. Bless your word today, we pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, amen. Would you stand to your feet?